Can that? you hear me now? I can hear you. All can right. You? All right, good. Man, the myth, the legend. I'm Dude. waiting to make it, make it so. All right, well, look, man, I, you know, I, I kept you for the, you know, the old saying, you keep the, uh, uh, you know, they, uh, we've had some amazing. It's been amazing. This has been a great lockdown leadership summit. What's, yeah. you, you've had some great presenters, dude. Congratulations. Yeah. That's awesome. But, uh, and yeah, I hope your listeners have been getting a lot out of it. Yeah, and I, it really has. And I, and I couldn't have done it without everybody's support. Yeah. But, you know, and I don't want to put like one person, everybody brought something totally different to the table. Yeah. Yeah. But from my personal humble experience, uh, I got to give you, you know, give some props to you because I know you're a humble guy as well. Yeah. I mean, I met you, Larry, and I know you don't, I know it was hard for you to remember this. I had to kind of remind you. But you made it to, I heard you speak literally three years ago at the Veterans Edge Conference. Okay. And I had, I just got my brand new personal coins and I had two. And I literally thought to myself, well, I believe in trying to make an impact or, you know, uh, and remind people. So yeah. I literally presented you, you were one of the two people at the entire conference I gave a coin to. Yeah. Because you made such a difference just with your speech alone, man. Mm, thank you. So I, I remember that speech. Yes. Yeah, that was fun. I've heard you two times since. You, yeah. And man, all right. So let me just get jump into this. So everybody knows. So I know we have a lot of military people listening in. Uh, I just promoted it again. Hopefully we'll have some more business people showing in from LinkedIn. Great. But uh, Larry Broughton is a little background on him. He is a former Green Beret. Like he's done, been in this, like literally in the, in the shit, if you will, <laughs> done the hard stuff got out, took what he's learned, and has literally been the poster child of taking the military uh, discipline and applying to entrepreneurship. He's now the CEO of Broughton Hotels, uh, number one best-selling author, keynote speaker. Uh, you've been on television probably countless times that I've seen, uh -huh. from CBS to, uh, you know, CSNBC, uh, CNBC. You've even been identified, what did they call you? the nation's foremost expert on leadership and entrepreneurship. That's all. I mean, <laughs> you've done all right in your time. And then, of course, my favorite is, you know, you've written an amazing book uh, that I've read. has been critical in my growth since retirement and getting into entrepreneurship, and that is okay. Victory, Seven Revolutionary Strategies for Entrepreneurs to Launch Your Business, Elevate and Impact, and Transform Your Life. Yeah. And then, of course, you did Flashpoints, too. That yeah. book, Larry, that's... That is awesome because you really talk about all facets. Yeah, so yeah. first, let me just start by saying I already did steal a little bit of your content today earlier Good. online. Good. I did. And, Good. I, and I just wanted to say everybody who heard me talk today about living your life in thirds, that was such a transformational concept that you taught me last yeah. year at the Acceleration yeah. Challenge that uh, it's been my day-to-day -day mantras, man. So good, Larry, good, brother, good. Hey, brother, I really appreciate your time. No, it's my pleasure. Are you kidding? It's, uh, they're interesting times that we're in. So this, I think the timing of this thing is amazing, right? You're doing a great job at this. I'm glad that, uh, that you're doing it. And thanks, by the way, for mentioning the Victory book, because I've heard it from a lot of people. Um, it's really just a roadmap for leaders um, that I wish I would have had mm -hmm. when I was launching my business. And um, just so that people know, the word victory. I don't know if you, do you have it there, but in front of you, by any chance? I actually do. So I want to kind of show the cover if, if, you, if you've yeah, got it. it go the word victory is really just an acrostic, right? So each letter in that has a different, means something different, like V is for vision, I is for intel, team is for teams, that kind of thing, right? But there's a couple other, I don't know if you remember this, Travis, there are a couple other great chapters in there that people I hear about more than any other chapters in there is the introduction. There you go. So if you look at that, like victory, it looks like an old Soviet propaganda poster, right? Um, and I've got that on there intentionally because to me, it's a thumb in the eye to the communist and socialistic forms of government. Because I'm a, I'm a capitalist. I think that, uh, I don't think, I know it's just a fact, capitalism and entrepreneurship has risen more people out of poverty than any other form of government mm -hmm. or social program that's out there. The stats are in the books. They're undeniable. It's not just me saying it's all kinds of different researchers, including Harvard. Right. Um, and, but the two chapters is the introduction. People love that introduction. And chapter nine, which is called Freedom Road. And Freedom Road is really kind of like a call to action. It's like plant, planting the stake in the ground um, about, darn it, government's not going to save our bacon. 
is going to be the entrepreneurship class. And to me, the entrepreneurial class are the warriors of our civilian society. So um, I'm glad that you got a lot out of it. Um, I wrote the book with a business partner years ago, and it was really meant more for just the military mm -hmm. uh, uh, folks. But with the second edition, it's got about 30% more content. Anyway, so I'm glad that you got a lot out of it. That was the, that was the intent. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, and by the way, I just got to do a plug because I didn't have it in front of me before, but Scott Benning, who was speaking earlier, this was his book. If you haven't seen that, uh, uh, I keep these right over here in my book. I just didn't want to step away, but I thought it was important to show your, your book. Yeah. And just so you know, I still have your words that you, know, you wrote in here three years ago when, when I got it. So, uh, oh, good, good. Uh, well, it, kind of, you're kind of like my own little uh, like entrepreneur rock star. So that's why well, I'm good. supposed to have you here, man. Well, it's funny, uh, you know, when, when Scott Benning and I met the other day, um, I get anxiety every time I, time I hear his name because of Fort Benning in Georgia, where I did basic <laughs> training, AIT, and jump school. And so I get a little anxious whenever. <laughs> Listen, Larry, I want to kick things off. I know uh, you, you are literally, the fact that you're taking time out today is, means more because I know what you're going through. Yeah. Uh, for yeah. everybody, you know, everybody needs to understand, Larry owns a hotel industry, <laughs> a, a hotel business. Yeah. If you can pick a one business that is literally taking it in the junk, it is your industry. So I want to talk yeah. about that, but I got to start out. I don't know if you've been paying attention to what I've been doing or watched any of these, but I've had a question that okay. I've asked out of the box right up front. So okay. I got to ask you if, uh, the, if you are a new addition to the crayon box, what color would you be and why? Oh my gosh. <laughs> what color? What color would I be? I think it depends. Honestly, at this point in my life or day, it probably depends on the moment. Uh, part of me feels like red um, because of the blood, sweat, and tears that I put into, into my business. And when you put your neck out on the line like we do as leaders, there's big risk that goes along with it. And usually red equals risk, right? You think about a stop sign. Why is it, why is it red? Because if you go through the stop sign or you blow through it, there's a big risk that it could be a bloody situation. Right. Um, so some kind of red, I suppose, blood red. I don't know. That's a good question. I'd never heard that one before. That's awesome. All right. I, I try to, I try to, I've been trying to, I had to recycle a couple of them, but uh, I thought it was a good, good little throw them out question. So good. What I want to do is I want to ask you a couple of questions about leadership because I want to stay, pay special attention to what you're going through because, yes, we have a lot of military audience uh, listening yeah. in. Uh, we yeah. had over 10,000 views yesterday. Nice. Uh, we're going to be actually, just so you know, we've actually had requests to send this entire summit uh, on disk to ships going underway. I heard that. That's awesome. So yeah. I think that's going to be fantastic. So. Yeah. I want to focus on some of the leadership because right now you were in special forces. You yes. already have the experience of leading in the military or in crisis. Yeah. You're leading through crisis right now yeah. in a different yeah. world. So let me just ask you up front, like what is your biggest challenge of how to keep your organization intact during literally apocalyptic times for your industry? Yeah, yeah it, they are apocalyptic times. Let me put things in perspective first, okay? Um, one in 25 Americans are employed in the travel industry, one in 25. And the industry is absolutely, I used the word decimated the other day and they said, I don't think that's enough. Decimated is like one in 20. It's like, it has been crushed, like kicked in the junk. Like you said, is what it feels like right now. Um, I saw a survey the other day that said that, but so we do hotels and restaurants. Uh, it's predicted that 50% of the restaurants uh, are not going to open when this thing is over. So like the favorite place you like to go with your loved ones, 50% likely it might not be there. Um, and a lot of people think that uh, hotels are owned by Marriott or they're owned by one of these big brands. Most hotels are owned by individuals like you and me who might have scraped together a few dollars, might have got a little bit of an inheritance or cast in their, uh, their savings and put a couple of friends together. And then they have, they used to franchise from these, you know, the Marriott's of, of the world. Uh, I started out in the hotel industry 30 some years ago in San Francisco, um, very vibrant city, right? I had a friend of mine uh, who is the CEO of a hotel company up there. And a couple of weeks ago, she sent me pictures of Union Square, the busiest part of the city where there's a bunch of hotels, the Mark Hopkins or Francis Drake, they're boarded up, literally boarded up. 
as if you're expecting a hurricane in Miami, plywood on the windows, nobody walking the streets. And then the next day I got a, uh, somebody sent me a picture. There were literally coyotes in Union Square in San Francisco. Whoa. This industry is decimated. Wow. Um, and so, and I'm not immune by the way, uh, to it. And so um, they say 90% of all hotels in the U.S. are closed right now. And those that are open are running single-digit occupancy, right. which means if they're running single-digit occupancy, every day they're open, they're losing money. Wow. Okay. Um, and so it is a tough time. And nobody budgets, Travis, for 0% revenue for extended period of time. Even after 9-11, how long were businesses closed? A week? Some of them? Some right. were open that day, right? And now we're, you know, it's been a month. So it's crazy. So it is apocalyptic times. And I guess it's less apocalyptic if you don't care. If you don't care about your team members, mm -hmm. it's less apocalyptic. But for right. me, it's apocalyptic because, and I know it's from my time uh, leadership earlier in my life and probably special forces that I care about people so much um, that it hurts me to know that we're laying people off um, or furloughing people and they don't know if or when they're coming back to work. Um, they've got bills to pay. Um, and none of us are putting money in our pockets right now. Even, you know, there are a lot of people who are angry at the one percenters, right? Um, but those one percenters are losing everything that they've got too. Right. I was talking to a buddy of mine who sold the company for a couple hundred million dollars last year, and he's lost more than 80 million in the market this year. I mean, since this thing had happened, um, he's not liquid for anything. I mean, that's another thing that people forget, that people who own and buy businesses, um, they oftentimes make less than some of their team members because what they're buying, what they're trading for being a business owner is the freedom and the control of their own life and not the pay sometimes. Now, don't get me wrong. There are some people who do really well who are business owners, but it's less than... 10% is probably around 7% of all businesses ever make over a million dollars a year in revenue. And then those business owners have to pay salaries and utilities and rent. And so by the, at the end of the day, um, it's, it's not a whole lot. Right. So it's apocalyptic uh, because we don't know when revenue is going to recover. And by the way, if you own a hotel or a restaurant, particularly a hotel, you have debt of tens of millions of dollars oftentimes, and lenders want to be paid. <laughs> they do. Um, and so it's, it's a tough time, it's a scary time. And so what we're seeing in the industry right now, Travis, is a lot of mergers, um, people taking over management companies for no money, just, hey, just take my liabilities uh, away from me. It's turned into the Wild West. That's yeah. what I've been doing today, just talking to a bunch of different uh, hotel owners and, do we merge? Do we bring in an investor? Do we do whatever? Because the scary part is, um, for me, when I really get a little bit anxious, because I do get anxious, you know. Um, you were very raw about that when we had our acceleration challenge, and I, and I, and I, I want to touch on that a little bit later, but yeah. Yeah, because um, the timing of this couldn't be worse for most people that are in the hotel industry, because uh, it's kind of a seasonal industry across most of the U.S., Mm -hmm. in that uh, we make most of our money during the spring and summer and we bank that, you know, we um, pay down our line of credits and then we tap into lines of credit during the winter months. Right about now is when we're starting to pull out of this. <laughs> right. So um, all of us are going into this with our lines of credit tapped out, no ca no, very little or no cash. And it's particularly challenged for hotel management companies like mine in that we don't make money unless the hotels are making money. Right. So if the hotels are making zero revenue and we get three or four percent of zero, we get zero. Right. Yet we're still contractually obligated to serve and service our hotels. How do you do that? So the, the exciting part is that there is innovation that's currently happening as we speak. We'll be doing things differently moving forward. Um, but it'd be interesting as we go on and have this conversation that we talk about how do you deal with fear and what do you do differently? But um, it got to the point though, Travis, uh, a couple of a week ago now, I guess, where I wasn't going to just roll over and play dead. 
I was actually going to, after reaching out to all of my capital sources, mm-hmm. um, who said, Hey, I don't have, I'm sorry. I wish I had 300,000 or 500,000 or a million dollars that I could uh, loan or invest with you. Mm-hmm. Um, that a friend of mine, actually a guy that you both, you and I know, um, a guy who was actually on this, this thing earlier, uh, Chris Dombach and I were talking one night. Um, and, uh, and also another uh, friend of mine was saying, why don't you do an appeal? Do an appeal to people that, that, that you know, that maybe you can get people to donate a hundred bucks or a thousand bucks or $10,000 to help you because, you know, I want to stay open, mm-hmm. not just for my sake. I mean, I, I, could, I could close up shop and I could just go be a public speaker. I could close up shop and just become a writer and, and I'd be fine, you know, right. Right. but that's not what I want to do. I love this industry. I love my team members. And so I did a plea that was, I had to humble myself, a key thing in leadership um, and ask, I asked publicly, Hey, is anybody, if you've got means, um, I'd love to keep paying my, my team members. If you got extra hundred bucks, I'd love to, if you, you'd share it with me and I'll be eternally grateful. And so we could talk about how that went over as well. <laughs> no, let's, let's roll right into it, Larry. Cause I mean, that's, that right there is a true testament of a leader and you know let's remember this whole topic was about leading through apocalyptic times yeah and man what you just suggested is probably one of the most uh challenging things that any leader can do is eating that big slice of humble pie and just uh, and just saying i need help because that's anybody's listening to this the number one problem that i always see is people are afraid to ask yes yeah yeah. So tell me that. I'm like, so how has been the response been on that? Because that right there, you're that's that, dude. That's I wouldn't thought of that. That's clawing, man. <laughs> that is clawing. And I had I had a, a, a hotel CEO. And they, they're larger than we are. Uh, call me. I actually told them I was going to do this, and so I sent him the video before I put it out. And I said, don't even try to talk me out of it because I made the decision after talking to Chris Donbach and a couple other people. They said, dude, you have to do it. You know, and so. I didn't want somebody in the industry to talk me out of it. So I sent it to him and said, you're going to see this. And he called me back and just said, dude, you're saying publicly exactly what the rest of us are feeling, but we don't have the mm to say it. Right. Um, and so, um, so how's it going? Well, um, the emotional support has been amazing. Um, the public support, like the comments online, um the the emails i've gotten a couple of cards the direct messages the text thousands right of people saying we're in the same boat you know i I wish i could help you out but boy you have inspired me over the years and here's the tidbit that i heard from you at this talk or we had a phone call one time and um um you know you kept asking me how what can you do to help me and i've now i'm now paying that for with other people but but we're at, um, to be honest with you, my ask was $375,000 and we're at 27000 So we're short. Short. We're falling short. Okay. But I'm not giving up. I continue, because people are saying to me, like, when, even people, some people in the company are like, when are you going to give up? And I said, I guess, um, I don't know. I, I know that I've been in deep spots before, right. um, but I, I'm working on some things, you know, that I think is going to help but those are always a ways out there. You know, nothing ever happens overnight. I've got enough to, you know, we'll make it through the next payroll. We'll be fine. Um, but um, I don't have any breathing room. That's for sure. Uh, at this point, you know, my, my hope is that it's pretty, pretty, pretty tight right now. huh? Exactly. I actually, I guess I can talk about talk like that on here, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. The pucker factor is high uh, at, at, at this point, but it's, it's very interesting because, um, you know, one of the things that I have been saying for years, and I've done social media posts about this, and, you know, I heard it in Special Forces years ago that tough times create tough men. Mm-hmm. Tough men create easy times. Easy times create weak men, and weak men create tough times. And it can be men or women, but that's how I heard it, so that's how I say it. Um, and uh, this time is going to create some very tough people. And, um, and I love that because I think that we've got battles still to win. Um, it has saddened me over the last uh, couple of decades where I think that we've gotten a little soft um, and uh, our feelings get hurt way too easily. Um, most people in this country have never seen real 
Um, and I hope that I wish in some ways they didn't, but perspective comes when you see suffering, mm -hmm. you know, and folks, uh, sadly, a lot of folks in the military have seen suffering up close and personal. Right. And so we have, we have a different change in perspective. Like oh, it ain't so bad here, you know, with all of our flaws as a country, we're still the well, best country in the like, world. Yeah. Like we've seen that. Yeah. Perspective. Yeah, that's right. Um, but with the entrepreneur class and the leadership class, Travis, we, it is life and death. When this happened in 2008 or whatever it was, I was at a, uh, you know, when that crash happened, I was at a CEO conference in, in Monterey. Uh, I've told the story a bunch of times recently. So if you've got listeners who've heard me before, I'm sorry. But I was at this uh, CEO conference in, in Monterey when the crash happened. And my company was by far the smallest company there. And there were a bunch of publicly, publicly held, tra traded companies as well. And that morning, um, you know, the market had already opened in the, in the east. Um, and we were in California. And so the market had been open for a couple of hours. And the, the folks who were coming down were just like the walking dead. And I got to admit, I didn't even look at the news that morning um, and didn't know what was going on. And then people started talking about, oh, my gosh, these companies just lost 30 percent valuations or 50 percent valuations or whatever it was. Forget now, I guess five or six of those CEOs that were that, at that conference took their own life that week. OK, so they're talking about right now that the economic impact on this. What's, what we're going through right now is worse than 9-11 and the 2000 and the last Great Recession crash combined. Combined, right? In fact, some people are saying it's going to be as bad as the Great Depression. And some are even saying potentially worse because of how quickly it's... That's, that's correct. That's right. So um, there will be death, not just from the virus, mm -hmm. but death from people whose self-worth is so tied to their net worth and to their um, public persona um that this could take them down we just and i know that by me what's that literally had somebody jump off the bridge here in my town on the highway and shut down the highway for hours this my heart goes out to their family whoever it was um and i'd be lying if that stuff like that hasn't flashed through my brain from time to time like really do you really i mean you're this old now do you really have that kind of fight in you but I have to remember the legacy that I want to leave behind for my family and friends, right? That I am I'm a fighter and I'm gonna fight through this, right? Um, because I do know that there is a dawning of a new day that, that's coming and our industry has been hit so hard and I just want us all to remember this, that sometimes it's just the last person standing. It doesn't even matter whether you're on wobbly knees. If you are standing at the end of it, um, then you are the victor. Right. Um, and so yeah. that's part of leadership, right? Hum humbling yourself enough for your team, not for you. Like I didn't do it for me. I could have walked away and no one ever would have known. Mm -hmm. Right. But there's something about transparency and authenticity um, that is attractive. I think for our team members, the, the message I was always getting from my team members is like making me cry. It's like, holy, it's bringing tears to my eyes because I was really scared. Like I don't want to embarrass them, but I want them to know that I'm fighting for them mm -hmm. um and so anyway so that's kind of what's what, what's been going on so you guys how's it going great emotional support not so much on the financial side <laughs> yet <laughs> well anybody who's listening i know unfortunately our audience a lot of military and it's you know it's not yeah. exactly we didn't join the military as you know to yeah, make get, money um yeah. that jump pay all that hundred i don't even know what jump pay is now hazardous duty pay what is hazardous duty pay now it was 110 yeah. bucks when i was in yeah it's, <laughs> So, uh, so they 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 pay you just enough to keep you uh, keep you moving up for the next pay grade. That's about it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. We, again, we didn't serve to we don't we don't raise our right hand for the money. We do it for the right. for the uh, being able to serve something higher than ourselves. Absolutely. And I think that's what we end up taking in with this. You know, when we get into entrepreneurship, and that's the reason yeah. why I think maybe I've resonated so much to your message. Uh, even prior to this, it's always been about putting people first. It's always been about uh, uh, you know, just putting things in perspective. But what I do see, though, is I see how you apply so much of your military leadership into yeah. the corporate world. Yeah. And I think the people who are listening here today can take a lot from this that, you know, what you what you learn in the military is applicable in almost any situation in life. That's that's the sad part. because I do get a lot of folks who are transitioning out because I 
live a lot in the veteran and transitioning veteran space mm -hmm. um, is they don't know how to translate what they've learned into the civilian community. But the number one thing I think that they ought to take with them and talk about all the time is that it's their willingness to serve. Mm -hmm. When we don't know what else to do, it's serve. So if somebody says to you, what's the best thing that you can bring to our organization? That's what I'd say. Listen, in the military, you learn to learn, lead, you learn to follow, but more importantly, you learn to serve. Serve right. whoever, whether it's our clients, whether it's our team members, whether it's the mission, mm -hmm. that's what's first. And I'm gonna I'll subordinate my own interest if it means that it's gonna help the rest of the team. Those are leadership qualities. And I think that's what we can really take mm -hmm. to organizations because there, here's the thing, there are lots of managers out there in the civilian community. There are lots of followers, there are a few leaders. Few leaders are willing to take, take a risk put their head on the chopping block and say, now or never. Hopefully you never need to do that, but you need to be willing to do that from time to time for your team, mm -hmm. right? And like it or not, I mean, that's happening right now in the Navy, right? Um, some people are standing up and it's getting different responses, but you, you better, um, the biggest fear is the anticipation mm -hmm. of how it might be received. But once you step up, it like stiffens your spine. You know, and then when you have a stiff spine, it stiffens the spine of the folks that are around you, right? And so it's, um, it's, it's testing my mettle for sure. And I consider myself kind of, I used to be a kind of a young Turk and I'm considered a wise sage. But even as, I, as a wise sage, I'm still learning. I'm still getting stronger and better. Um, and uh, oftentimes though, it's like anything, Travis, like even going to the gym, if I want to get a bigger chest and bigger arms and bigger legs, I've got to put some real stress and strain on them, right? And it hurts. Right. Um, and uh, that's how it feels sometimes. It hurts, but I know that's going to be better on the other side. Absolutely. Well, look, I, I, I want to do these live too. because Yeah, sure. You know, I got a live question here. Uh, Great. Again, Manny Aponte always stepping up. This guy is never shortage of, uh, of questions. I've known him for years. Okay, uh, but but he's very like drawn to what we're doing. So yeah. uh, Manny asks, as the head of your company, yeah. how do you reach down to your employees that are suffering suffering through financial hardships and personal hardships themselves, and try to make them feel better and more optimistic about what everybody's going through? Yeah, that's a great question, Manny. One of the mantras that I have, and I find myself saying it every day. So right now we do because uh, we have to work remotely, and we've always done this anyway. We've always done Zoom calls. But um, for our home office folks now, and we just started doing this this week, we were doing them every other day, and now we're doing them every day. We're doing morning stand-ups basically just via Zoom, mm -hmm. right? And I find myself doing a little mini pep rally <laughs> to start with. Right. Um, what are you grateful for? And we go around and we ask people what they're, what they're grateful for. Um, but one of the things I remind people is that uh, – Crisis communication is over communication. You have to overly communicate during times of crisis. And communication isn't just me talking to you, Travis. It's me listening to. It's the act of communication that you taught me, right? Yeah, there you go. It's got to be two-way kind of stuff, right? Um, so how do I do it? Well, what I try to do is make sure that it trickles down. And so I have these conversations with our home office people. Uh, today at four o'clock, I'm having that conversation with all of our general managers, right? Mm -hmm. And just keep pushing it down into every nook and cranny. Um, but you can't, I, I don't think you can, maybe you can. I, I think it's very difficult. It might be a better way to put it. I think it's very difficult to have this servant style of leadership, which it sounds like you're asking about mm -hmm. um, today, if I hadn't had it before. Because <laughs> there's a credibility issue. Right. If, I was, if I was a hard ass before and didn't treat my team members with dignity and respect and compassion before, and then all of a sudden I start doing it today, doing it today they're going to be like, who is this freak show? Right. right? You have to build, fill the emotional bank account, right? Um, and so how do we do it? Well, we started doing it years ago when people started seeing that we led with compassion. You know, like in our organizations, uh, like at the home office, uh, once a month we stop what we're doing at 11 o'clock and we make sack lunches, about 150 sack lunches for one of the local children's homes, right? And even if I'm having, if you were in my office, Travis, and we were having a meeting talking about real estate and 11 o'clock hit on that Wednesday, guess what? You're going to join me in the kitchen, in the break room, and we're going to be making sandwiches, throwing fruit, you know, drinks, granola bars into a bag with a little message in that bag 
so that you know some kid who doesn't have the money for a lunch sack lunch gets it that day little things like that i think teaches compassion that we do care uh -huh. um but we've done we have an employee it's called this only because this is what it's called in the industry an employee assistance program um, where we have it's based on the uh military chaplaincy program it's called marketplace it's called market marketplace chaplains there's well marketplace chaplains is one of them there's another one called uh corporate chaplains of america and it's just a non-denominational kind of thing and they come in and they check on all of your team members confidentially just to see how things are going but just like in marriage you know what the number one uh cause of conflict in a marriage is hmm. money of course money money is why in the bible they have money is the root of all evil right <laughs> um I don't know, it's the way we treat money. I don't think it's money itself is the root of all evil, but it's the way we worship and we hang on to money, right? And the way we mismanage money. If anything good is gonna come out of this nanny, um, I think it's gonna be that, um, I, my hope anyway, is that we have a higher level of respect for money. Um, and that we start preserving it, we start growing it, we start building it. Um, so that when there is another downturn, we all got to have a little bit more cushion because the truth is most people don't have that three to six months reserve that we all should have, right? And particularly among um, low-income families mm -hmm. who are just trying to put food on the table, you know? If, if and so we, average American, if they were hit with a $400 unexpected bill, they could not pay it. Yeah. Well, guess what? Every American is being hit with that right now. It's called rent called credit card payments it's called uh car payments because uh, they have zero income yeah i mean and, and, and make no mistake you hit it before the banks are that you know everybody got all excited when the bank's saying hey we're going to give a forbearance for your mortgage the, i mean i put videos out on this already this is yeah. a not a good thing yeah yeah the, yeah <laughs> they still ask it's not they're not forgiving you they're not, it's right. not forgiveness it's forbearance forbearance right the bill is still going to come due and it's either going to become due in 90 days where you pay it all or it's going to be added on to the end or it's going to be spread across you know so many months but you right. still have to pay it and you're probably paying it on less revenue than you were making before Exactly. Because I can promise you this, not everyone's income is going to go back to 100% after this. If the, the past has been any indicator, if you were taking a 50% or a 20% or a 10% pay cut and you're still working, it's going to be that way for a long time. Right. So you no. need to adjust your, your spending on this. So Manny, what we do is we do try to over communicate and we try to offer as much compassion as possible. Um, years ago, and I think Travis even has a copy of this, I did a thing called 48 um in fact i should write this down um for myself uh we gave tips on 48 ways uh to improve your home cap your home and business cash flow mm -hmm. um oh, everything yeah. like tips. yeah yeah and so um we just try to teach people as best we can on money management but really compassion goes a long a long long way mm -hmm. that's, that's gonna great. be a long ramble for an answer but no no larry that's this is this is all good stuff man um so I guess if I want to dive into a couple other uh, questions uh, as we go is, because I do, actually, I want to reserve, actually, you know what, now's probably a good time for this. Uh, I, I thought about the fact that one of the, one of the things that you've done for me now on two different occasions, uh, that is you put me on a hot seat. Oh, gosh. <laughs> okay. So I figure during these crazy times and us supporting each other, yeah. what better way than to kind of put you on a quasi hot seat since okay. you, you have been so, you know, very open and vulnerable about what you're going through mm -hmm. and, you know, let people know that. And because I think here's the big takeaway I have from this, Larry, is that you're the CEO of a company and people like have the perception, oh my gosh, the business owner, he's untouchable, is this, but man, we feel it. Just, in, just as much, if not more anxiety than some, we did. I know I do. I feel more anxiety now than I did when I was joining the military and I was in downrange in the military. Yeah, well, before we do the hot seat, let me just expand on that for a second. Sure. I encourage everybody on here to do what I call a sphere of influence. Okay, you want to put things in perspective? Do your sphere of influence. Well, what is a sphere of influence, Larry? Identify all of the people that you directly touch mm -hmm. in your life. And so if you're a business owner, it's my team members, it's my vendors, it's my partners, it's my family, um, that kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Right, what's the second ring of that? Well, it's not just my team members. And by the way, we call them team members, not employees for a reason. And this kind of goes back to Manny's uh, question earlier, is that if we call your folks that work with you, not for you, with you, team members, um, rather than employees, they will show up like team members, okay? They will act like team members. Team members have the understanding that we're all in this together, okay? Employees will walk in and act like employees. Is it payday, boss? Thank God it's Friday, that kind of thing, right? I would rather have team members around me. So my sphere of influence is not just my team members, it's my team members' families. And it's not just my team members' families, it's the nanny or the barber or the gardener that if I'm not paying them, the barber and the gardener's not getting paid either. Well, guess what? The same thing with our vendors and our contractors. It's them, but it's also their families, right? And the people that they could be employing as well. So I remember when I did this for the first time, um, and then investors and, you know, you can come up with the whole list of people, right? Who do I, you know, you come up with the long tail. I remember doing this for the first time, probably, uh, I don't know, let's say 17, 15, 17 years ago. And it was about 186,000 people back then. I wasn't doing the public speaking I'm doing now. I wasn't doing the TV, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so it was smaller. I am afraid to do it now, but when I just look at my team members, right? Um, that's a lot of, you're talking about pressure. That's a lot of pressure when you really look at the sphere of influence that if I fold up shop, I'm impacting all of those, negatively impacting all of those people's lives. But if I fight, if I fight on, if I uh, live my life with integrity and I show that I'm willing to humble myself for them, not for me, because I'm not taking a salary, I haven't taken a salary for two months. Mm-hmm. Um, but for them, and by the way, I can't afford it like anybody else, okay? I've got bills to pay too. I don't have a big bank account. I'm the classic entrepreneur, asset rich, cash poor. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, that, uh, and, and by the way, these are assets I can't sell, right? Mm-hmm. In a down market, come on. Um, so it it's, can be absolutely overwhelming, the level of um, pressure and um, sense of obligation that I have for people. So I just want to make sure that, that we understood that first before we do the hot seat. So what do you want to do with the hot seat? Well, I think it's, I think it's exactly that. Like it, it was here, you're going through a trying time in your business. And, and I think that doing a hot seat, just like it did with me, okay. uh, can sometimes maybe create a, maybe an aha moment. Well, good. I'm sure you've probably yeah. uncovered every rock you can, but. Maybe, maybe. But uh, so the way we usually do hot seats is what's my biggest challenge, opportunity or idea, right? Mm-hmm. So my biggest challenge right now, given that uh, people are not lending, uh, money or investing money into service organizations that aren't asset backed uh, to have six months of uh, payroll reserve to pay, keep my uh, team members paid. And that money, that's about $375,000. And I think that was under 60 seconds. By the way, you have to do that in under 60 seconds. Because <laughs> what I say is if you, if you can't state your biggest challenge opportunity or idea in 60 seconds, you haven't thought about it enough. <laughs> right, and just so you know, everybody, this is something you can apply. This is very, uh, this sure. could be applied if you're in the military too, right? Because yeah, right. you could take anything that you're trying to do. Yeah. And, you know, if you're trying to get that next promotion or whatever, you can apply this hot seat uh, yeah. concept. So yeah. based upon what you've found, what has been, what directions have you gone now to try to resolve that so far? All right, good question. So the first one I did this, well, it's not the first one. Um, Burned through cash flow first, looked at our line of credit second, um, tried to collect on some receivables that people owed us, tried to collect those. But again, if people don't have money, they're not paying receivables. Um, applied for the SBA loans, the PPP programs, the EIDL, EIDL. Um, uh, $10,000 grant, um, other, um, what do you call them, just private grants from different organizations. Uh, so we've done all those. The problem with those, just as a sidebar, is those are weeks away from even being approved, let alone funded. Um, what else? Called virtually every person that I know um, and don't know, but was a referral from somebody. Um, approached the bank. Um, considered selling gift certificates, but there's a problem. I'm not selling the gift certificates. What, the, what I need to fund right now is the management company and not the hotels. 
I can't sell gift certificates for the hotels and take the benefit for the management company. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, and just what so else? I want everybody to know, he, Larry, Larry Broughton, Broughton Hotels, he has actual brick and mortar, but he's also the number one hotel, like rated, number one rated hotel management company last year, according to in the country, right? Oh, I don't know about that, but we're, the people know who we are, definitely. We're, we're a highly respected organization, for sure. We're really known for, you know, kind of our creativity and operational excellence and, and that kind of thing. There's a lot of great hotel companies out there. There are thousands, actually. But we, um, yeah, we're known, we're respected, for, for sure. But yeah, so we operate uh, the hotels and restaurants in there. So that's kind of what we've done thus far. Awesome, awesome. All right, so... With that being said, uh, have there been, is there, has there been any positive returns from, you know, I know you said you've managed to get 27,000 of people. Have you, uh, yeah. 27,000 people, $27,000. $27,000, right. Yes, out of 375, which is our goal, yes. Right, so um, has there been any positive, like, like responses that has at least pointing you in the right direction? Uh, about getting more money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, there's been a few. Um, yeah, there's been a few. I mean, some people said, hey, have you, in fact, I, we applied for a grant yesterday that I had never heard of before. I think it's a $10,000 grant. Um, so yeah, those kind of things. But again, those are all apply, we'll consider mm -hmm. approval. Um, there's been lots of ideas, but they're usually the ones, hey, have you heard of PPP? If, why aren't you selling gift certificates on a few, on future days? Oh, here, here's one somebody said, and I'll, I'll offer this. You see me do keynotes. I think I do a pretty good job. The keynotes, not to sound too much like Trump and tooting my own horn, <laughs> but I, I, I love doing keynotes, and I hear that people love them as well. Um, and you can go to my personal website and take a look. It's LarryBroughton.me, www. I hate saying that, but LarryBroughton.me. I typically charge $20,000 to get on a plane and go do a keynote. Mm -hmm unless it's for a veteran's cause. It's different. Oftentimes I'll volunteer my Thank time. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. <laughs> $20,000 donation he's doing for us right now. <laughs> so um, what I would do the, oh, so it's, and then $15,000 if it's local, right? If it's in Southern California. And I don't have to get on a plane, don't have to be with my family because there's the opportunity cost, right? Um, but if you, if your business, and I know that there aren't a lot of E4s that are walking around with $10,000 that they can do this for, but maybe there's a command, maybe there's something out there um, that needs a leadership training or a team building training or a keynote on mindset, on overcoming and defying the odds, uh, overcoming failure. If you do a donation to the company, and by the way, this money's not going to my pockets. Mm -hmm. It's going into help payroll for my team members, yeah. okay? Um, then I'll, I'll come and do whatever you need, whether you need a, a two-day training, whether you need a 90-minute or 60-minute keynote, I'll do those for you. Um, but, um, um, but yeah, I mean, if, if you got 50 bucks, I don't, I don't want your last 50 bucks. I don't want, want your last 100 bucks. But if you got a little something, I mean, we've had people who have donated 25 bucks. You know, we've had some people who have done $1,500, right? Um, but I understand that everyone is tight. It is right now. It's tight for everybody. I'm not the only one. This is why, you know, it's tough during these times, but I, I had to ask, mm -hmm. I, I had to ask, um, and, um, I'm not done fighting yet. So, That's so awesome. yes. yeah. Well, dude, Larry, I, I think that, you know, obviously the hot seat is, is more design. You're the, you're the expert on the hot seat and it doesn't always produce the answers, but sometimes just talking through it, well, actually, one thing was, you know, Manny's question, you know, I created this 48 ways to improve your cash flow for people like you who have gone through my training programs, right? But I've not given that to all my team members. Well, why the heck not? Hmm. I should be doing that. That idea came out of this. That's there awesome. You yeah. There you go. That's awesome. Yeah. And, well, Manny has another, uh, let me see what he has. Of course he does. <laughs> so let's, let's, let's keep him good to love. He says, I love the team members mentality that worked amazingly when he was a, a leading a chief petty officer um, with the N4 department, but each crew uh, without what he was charged. Unfortunately, the most senior listed in these crews were not open to that mindset and uh, their junior set, but the junior sales were, and it was very successful. So he used that concept before, but obviously trying to shape other people to follow that concept. Well, the great thing is in the civilian world, those people, I, I get to say, here is the culture here. And if you don't like it, this is not the right place for you. And you're right. In the military, 
we oftentimes don't have a choice of who's in our command or our chain of command, right? And there are some people um, who love the command and control style of leadership. And this is not everyone, but what I'm about to say does affect some, some folks, and I think you'll get this. Oftentimes, those people who have to live and die by command and control mm-hmm. style are those that are either fearful, right? Um, or they've not taken the time or energy to build respect and com- compassion between the leader and those that are, that are following. Mm-hmm. If you take the time to really build relationships and get your team members to love and respect you, even in the military, love and respect you, they will crawl across glass for you. And you don't need to tell them, do it because I'm the E7 and you're the E3. You know, oh, absolutely. Um, you don't have to do that. They do it because they respect you and, you, and you, the proof is in the pudding, you know? Um, and so I, I, I will fight day and night to get people to call each other team members because at the end, here, let me give you just a quick little story here. By the way, this is David Deary is the president of our foundation. He's stepping in to listen in to finish this out for the day. Yeah, oh, good. So um, I am... Um, Shortly after I got to my special forces team at Fort Devens at t- at 10th group, um, we were out getting ready to go do a jump. And I remember, cause I thought I was all hot crap at that point. You know, I'm a young green beret and all this kind of stuff. And I'd heard other people call some of the support people pogues, you know, personnel other than grunts, right? This is a derogatory term sure. uh, for, uh, for people if you're not in the military. And so I remember calling this uh, tr- truck driver, not to his face, but I called him a pogue. And I am really glad my team daddy, uh, Jerry Janice, pulled me aside and said, and just jacked me up, basically. That's not what we do here. That's not who we are. For every 12 of us guys, there's about 120 who are helping us get down range and to do our training. And the last thing you want is somebody who's on the support team to be, to not respect you or love you or care for you because those are the folks who are getting us out there. We can't do our job if we don't have them. Right. And it made me really realize that we're all on the same level. We just have different jobs. Mm -hmm. That's all. And they're doing the best that they can. They love what they're doing. Um, And that doesn't make me any better than them. So I don't think you'd find anybody in our organization who would say, oh, Larry thinks he's the CEO. And so it's like, I'm, that's just happened to be the, the role I fill. I'm not any better than our room attendants or our dishwashers or, or anybody else. Mm-hmm. So uh, that, I just love the whole, the team approach. So anyway, I get rambling. Uh, Larry, like, like that's, that you, you nailed it because that's something that even in the military, that's, you know, the advantage, too, that we have in the military, as you know, is that you, we teach leadership from literally day one. The yeah. entire, uh, like, and that's actually a good segue, bringing in David in here. The, his, his entire vision with this foundation was to actually allow uh, and, and just reinforce leadership from the deck plate all the way up. Yes, yes. Right? Uh, so, man, well, I really want to take a chance here because, uh, I mean, David stepped in here. He wanted to come and catch the last minute of this. So I'm sure he has maybe a question too. He wants to throw Correct. your way as well. Good. Um, and before we finish up for the day, but man, Good. all right, Dave, what you got, man? Hey, Larry, I just, I just want to thank you for taking the time. Oh, it's uh, an honor. Being, thank you. No, yeah, really being transparent. And I, I really appreciated what you, a lot of what you said, but, but clearly at the end, when you talk about building, you know, love and trust, you know, love and respect, which, you know, that's what leads to trust. And, and one of our core, four core values that we impress upon in our leadership program is, is empathy and in and, and understanding, not necessarily agreeing where people are at, but, you know, when you have built those relationships with people, you can become empathetic and, and they're going to come to you. You know, I, I, when I served, Man, I'll tell you what, by, by the time a, level, some, a problem got to my level, there were so many times downstream that if, right. if we would have shared, had some love and respect, if there had been some trust, maybe we could have headed, help, headed it off. Yeah. But, but really, it's that, that tip of the iceberg, right? We, we just tend to see what's above the water. Man, so much underneath the water. Yeah, it's so, I'm glad that that resonated uh, because when you have love and respect, 
you're able to seek understanding mm -hmm. rather than agreement. As a leader, I would rather understand than agree. Because when we understand where people are coming from, we can adjust fire, right? We can adjust relationships um, without throwing people, people out. Um, I think that's the, one of the problems that the people that get who need command and control do it because I said so, they want agreement, not understanding. Mm -hmm. um, understanding is scary sometimes, seeking that. You just wish everybody would agree with you, but we're all different. We all, all got our own opinions. Um, but when you're open to ideas and you do kind of co collaborative style of leadership rather than competitive, great things come out of it. Oh, ab absolutely. You know, uh, <clears throat> you know when, when for me to have understanding is going to allow people to come and ask me why. You know, yeah. hey, why did we do that? Why, why is a command doing this? And what better opportunity as a leader to be able to train leadership or to teach leadership right there on the spot? Exactly. But right. to explain the thought process behind. They may not agree with it. Yeah. And a lot, a lot of times, let, let's be honest, they don't agree with those yeah. bigger decisions because, you know, any, any change affects people and it doesn't affect people the same. Uh, the person who has the idea of change thinks it's a great idea. <laughs> uh, but but those underneath that have to affect the change don't think as much. Yeah, so yeah. whenever I had an opportunity to say, you know, thanks for coming and asking, let me explain to you why we did this and the thinking yeah. behind it. Oftentimes like, yeah, I, I still don't agree, but I get it. Yeah. And I, I can support it. That's good. Yeah. Live in action. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you another question, Larry, here. Okay. That's important because you've gone through a, a lot of different things. I remember when I sat down with you, you were also transparent about like, you know, this is the journey. It's, you're going to have peaks and valleys and everything. Yeah. Else. Yeah. From your experience, uh, uh, how can a leader fail? Like, what if you're leading an organization? What is the number one trip point that you've seen leaders make mistakes on that they've lost, like, the trust of their people that are working with them? Um, boy, I wish I had just just one. Maybe we can start listing them. Um, not listening uh, to their team members, not being truthful with their team members, hiding or shading the truth. I think it all comes down to integrity. That's the thing I hear over and over again. Um, and particularly, like, I've, I've heard so many sad stories just in the last week from people saying, I wish that our leader would have dealt with what we're going through or went through uh, the, way that, the way that you did. Um, and uh, so I think probably the fatal flaw or a fatal flaw is integrity. Um, and, um, poor communication is probably another one. One of the things I try to remember is that, um, if you want to be a transformational leader, you have to be a master storyteller. Um, you have to take people on the journey of why we're doing things. And so oftentimes those folks who don't take the time, I say folks, most of those leaders who don't take the time to take their team on the journey of why we're doing this, like David was saying earlier, um, those are the ones that tend to fail because people start quite like scratching their heads, why are we doing this? And then they start sniping in the background, and they start questioning your judgment. But if you communicate effectively on the front end of why you're doing something, um, I think that you can cut down on the chatter and uh, people can see your heart on why you're making the decision. Um, and that's pretty darn uh, important. I know that the, the people that I remember from the military were the ones that had the biggest hearts yeah. because we got this nailed. The, the warrior part, we got nailed. Right. And a lot of folks don't, a lot of people who have not been in the military don't understand this. Um, you guys will get this though. Um, the people, the most badass mofo warriors that I know are also the most loving people that I know. Cause you don't put yourself out, of, out on a limb for someone else. You don't risk your life for someone else. Um, unless you love deeply, you love the person on your right and left and behind you, but you love your family that you're protecting from back home. In my case, I love my team member so much. I'm willing to make a fool out of myself, you know, because of it. I'm, I'm willing to damage my own personal relationship, uh, reputation, um, to be looked at like, oh my gosh, your company, you must be in terrible trouble or whatever it is. There's people, there's chatter going on for sure about it. So anyway, um, integrity is probably the big thing. Okay. Yeah. Well, Larry, let me ask you this. So, uh, and again, respect for your time, because I know you have so many other things going on. I get going. Uh, dude, this is, a, this is the platform, man. Is there anything else that you feel that 
our audience might want to hear from your perspective and your experience in leader. Like if you had a, like one thing, one piece of nugget to give about leadership, what would it be? Um, fight, fight on, do it as much as you can, as best as you can with a positive upbeat spirit, because you can't light a fire with a wet match. It's hard to get your team enthused and behind you if I'm walking around dour and pessimistic, right? Fight on. It's hard to fight on though if you don't know what you're fighting for. And so if you don't even know what you're fighting for, just serve somebody else. Like there, there have been times these past few weeks where I had no idea what to even do. And so I reached out to somebody else and said, hey, do you need any help for me? What can I do to help you out? And it doesn't mean, you know, you gotta, you know, get out of the military or go, you know, move to India and work in orphanages. Just help out your neighbor. Help somebody put groceries in their car. Let somebody in front of you on the freeway when we start driving on freeways again. Help somebody put baggage in the overhead compartment when we start getting on planes again. That kind of little acts of service tends to inspire us a little bit more. Um, but more than anything else, when once you realize what your mission is, fight on. I love that, man. Well, Larry, I can't thank you enough for your time, brother. This is. Uh, Can I do one ask please? before we go? Yes, absolutely. I do need people's help. I've already been out there publicly about this. Like I said earlier, if you've got, if you're a part of an organization that can that needs, uh, I don't usually toot my own horn like this, but really, I've been around the world speaking to people like Toyota, Lexus, the Pentagon, Walmart, you name the the university. I've been there. Whether it's been hospitals credit unions, multi-level marketing or direct marketing organizations, I've spoken to them. You can see the, the hundreds of testimonials that are on my LarryBroughton.me me website and people tend to get value. If, if you're somebody like that who has that thing, put, reach out to me, make that $10,000 or more donation, I'll, I'll work with you on that. If you're somebody who's got 50 bucks in your pocket and you're willing to help me out to pay the salaries of my team members, not me, um, then I'll ask you to go to, and here's a little gift for you. Go to one of my websites. It's called yougozi.com, Y-O-O-G-O-Z-I.com slash gifts and make that donation. And that video on there, where I do the video plea that Travis has talked about a couple of times is on there. But if you go to yougozi, Y-O-O-G-O-Z-I.com slash gifts, I would covet your gift, your donation. Um, I will be eternally grateful to you. You will hear personally from me. I don't care whether it's five bucks or 5,000 bucks. You're going to hear personally from me, um, uh, giving you a word of thanks for it because um, we're able to continue to pay medical insurance for our team. Uh, we're able to put uh, keep our team members employed. Yeah. So that's, that's my ask. And, I, and believe me, my friends, if, if I didn't have to do that, I wouldn't. Uh, but I, I, but I really, I, I need it. I need help. I think it's a true testament that your whole topic was leading through apocalyptic times. And this is being a leader because you are trying to get and lead your people through these ridiculously crazy, unprecedented times. For sure. And For sure. so, you know, yeah, I encourage you. I, I'll be, I'll be on there later. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, my and look, Larry, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Travis. Yeah. As always, you're an amazing mentor of mine, and thank I you. look forward to our relationship in the future, my friend. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. Go get them, Take folks. Care. Take care, Larry. Thanks, David. We'll see you. Bye. Thank you.